Science and nature, they go hand in hand like spaghetti and meatballs. What does it feel like to get sung a thousand times? I don't know, and I don't want to find out. Got a hankering for the science behind climate change and soil, but you came to the right place. This is Justin Schmidt. Yeah, my name is Justin Schmidt. He's an entomologist. And I'm an entomologist. I basically study stinging insects. He's been stung by a lot of insects. I've probably been stung at least a thousand times. He reviews insect stings the way a sommelier reviews wine. Pure, intense, brilliant pain, like walking over flaming charcoal with a three-inch nail embedded in your heel. Which insect was that? That's the bullet ant. This is his lab in Tucson. This is his harvester ant. This is his vinegaroon. This is his tarantula hawk. These are some more harvester ants in a park near his lab. He is the creator of the Schmidt Pain Scale. The Schmidt Pain Scale is basically a scale to rate the painfulness of stinging insects on a scale of one to four. A one would be a sweat bee. Two would be something like a yellow jacket wasp. The three would be something like a harvest ant. And a four would be a tarantula hawk. How bad is a four? Four is absolutely excruciatingly debilitating, incapacitating, just shuts you down. Just absolute sheer pain. There's just nothing you can really do about that. I don't think I'd want to be stung by a whole bunch of different fours. I, I don't think I could endure that for very long. Let's be clear. Justin Schmidt doesn't just go out and get stung on purpose. It's just that he's dedicated his life to studying, well... My passion is insects and stinging insects in particular. Yeah, I get stung, but that's, that's all just part of the passion. You know, that, that gives me data. You know, sting helps me in understanding what the insect's doing. And I get to be out in the sunshine and out in the rain, out in the environment, studying these magnificent, beautiful insects. It's just, just such a joy. I can't imagine anything I'd rather do more. I know what I'd rather do, and it's not that. It's find out about climate change. Let's get to the nitty gritty here. It's still a category five hurricane. You need to take this seriously and you need to get out. It is my responsibility to empower my audience to know more about climate change in a way that people not only understand it, but accept it from a trustworthy source. The hottest day so far. This great big story was made possible by the all-electric Jaguar I-PACE. Hi, good afternoon to both of you. So there's the hurricane now, 185 miles per hour. John Morales has been forecasting the weather in Miami for nearly 30 years. He's gained a loyal following for his straightforward reporting, especially in times of crisis. And he's using his position to educate his audience on an important issue, climate change. He started his journey as a weatherman when he was just a boy. I grew up in Puerto Rico, and therefore I'm a tropical cyclone and hurricane uh, aficionado. Back in those days, I would keep statistics on every single hurricane. In 1991, John began forecasting for Spanish language news channels in Miami before moving to NBC in 2009. And so he is very familiar with the specific threats to this region in the face of climate change. For South Florida in particular, climate change is an immense threat. Sea level rise, stronger hurricanes, freshwater flooding, heat index values often exceeding 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Through his work, John also makes it clear that this region could serve as a warning for what other parts of the world may face in the near future. Yesterday at the White House, the president and vice president met with weather forecasters from around the country to discuss global climate change. Back in the 1990s, the awareness around climate change was starting to grow. However, John noticed that most weather forecasters were not talking about the issue. TV weather consultants do not want us to talk science on air. They think that you don't understand those things. There have been some significant challenges in terms of broadcast meteorologists becoming climate communicators. 
some alarming numbers had come up regarding the skepticism amongst my community. Many uh, broadcast meteorologists were not even accepting of the state of the science of climate change. Out of the six record warm temperatures that were in jeopardy today, we hit four. I felt that I had the gravitas to be able to get on air without asking permission and start discussing and communicating climate. Today, the science of climate change has become widely accepted amongst broadcast meteorologists. And just in time, too, as extreme weather has become more frequent in the past decade. One such weather event, Hurricane Maria, led to the moment John considers the most difficult in his career, as the storm bore down on his home island of Puerto Rico. I did a Facebook Live from an empty conference room, and the message was, sometimes the worst does happen. I urge people to be mentally strong. I ask them to uh, stay safe inside, but be ready for a long aftermath. Prepárense mentalmente, porque van a ser unas horas bien largas y bien difíciles. It got shared, it got viewed about a million times. Emotionally, it was very difficult to forecast what I knew was going to be just a horrific natural disaster. And so for John, the responsibility of being a meteorologist weighs on him especially in times of extreme weather. Broadcast meteorologists are entering these folks' households, or perhaps these days entering their smartphones, to provide a weather forecast on a daily basis, and they've come to trust us. It is our responsibility to communicate on climate change and stand up in defense of science. That's what I want to continue doing heading forward. Highs in the mid-70s, it should be quite the skies to the ground, let's find out about soil. This is pretty close to a perfect morning. We got a beautiful sunrise coming up here. That's beautiful. Heavenly. And the cows think so as well. <laughs> They're liking that grass. It's cold today and windy. And so I wanted to get this baby calf picked up and brought him in here. It would be nice and warm and dry. There you go, little fella. As you can see, these cows mean a lot to me. When I was growing up as a kid, I was assigned to take care of the baby calves. And uh, I learned how to love them and how to care for them. I think they feel love just as much as any one of us do. The cow is what she eats. In order to have the high quality, great tasting milk, we've got to have her eating high quality, great tasting food as well. Cows are kind of like any one of us. They've got likes and dislikes, and uh, they're not afraid to voice their opinion by mooing at you. Cows naturally love to eat grass. That'd be their number one choice. When our soil is healthy, that's what creates the right quality of crop for the cows. We strive to plant the pasture with a variety of different species in our grass to create biodiversity. These legumes, or clovers, they offer different types of nutrients for the cows. Each one of these plants pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and places it into the soil as carbon. You'll notice as these cows are walking around, they're releasing their manure across the grass, and the cows will stomp this down into the soil, and this will become a nutrient source. Within the soil is a little ecosystem all of its own. There's all sorts of little organisms that live in there. And if I mistreat my ground, then the soil will, will be depleted. Horizon Organic supports family farms by helping us have the know-how that we need to ensure that our soil is being protected and to be able to market our milk throughout the country. We all have the, the same goal, to produce the very best milk possible. I take great pride in my family farm. Millions of people expect me to take good care of my animals and my crops so that they have clean, healthy food to eat every day. You want to be a farmer, Haas? Mm -hmm. What about you, Stagger? You want to drive big tractors? Mm -hmm. One thing that is everlasting is the soil. I'm farming the soil that my grandpa and my great-grandpa and my dad farmed, and it brings me a huge amount of joy to not only myself, but my family. <laughs>